for that reminder. You know, so many people want Jesus to be their Savior, but they balk, oh, at making Him their King. But let me tell you something. If He's not your King, He's not your Savior. It's not an either or. It's both and. And so He is both Savior and Lord. Savior and Lord, you are my King. Years ago, Paul Harvey, how many of you remember Paul Harvey on, on the... Oh, good, good, good. I love Paul Harvey. I have several of his books on my shelf. Uh, during one of his radio broadcasts, he said, The world has become so churchy, and the church has become so worldly, that you can't tell the difference anymore. Well, I, I don't know if the world has become more churchy, but you know, it does seem that the world has become... Uh, more secular today than, than any time I, I can remember. And it seems certainly true that the church has indeed become more worldly. And I, I'm not referring to things like, you know, music that we use or, or dress or things like that. I'm talking about things like, do we really believe what God has to say about things, like things like morality? Do we believe that saints live one way and sinners live a different way? Do we believe this? And that's the message this morning of Ephesians in our continuing study as we venture now into chapter 5 of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. And our passage has a simple outline for us. It's a reminder, it's a warning, and then a reason. And each part helps us to clearly see the difference between what it means to be a saint and a sinner. Now, a saint is someone who has received Jesus Christ, not because they have a special role within the church. A saint is someone who has been born again of the Spirit, has been sanctified or cleansed by the Holy Spirit, has become a child of God. So first, the reminder, who are we? Now, everything that Paul says in this passage goes back to our spiritual identity. We are children of God. Verse 1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Now, the Christian life begins right here. And it's not about what we do so much as who we are. Or to say it another way, what we do flows out of who we are. You see, when we know who we are, it's not hard to figure out what we're supposed to do. We are, it says, to imitate our Heavenly Father. Why? Because we're His children. Now, to imitate God means to follow His example because we have entered into God's family by birth through Jesus Christ. And as a result, we belong to God. We bear His name. And we share a family resemblance. Now, I can't tell you how many people I run across who say, you know, you and Ben sound so much alike. Or, or George, there is no question that Josh is your son. Or Sarah is so much cuter than you, she must take after Lynette. I mean, I hear that all the time. <laughs> Lynette and I were on vacation a, a couple of weeks ago, and we were walking down this street, and, and I heard her say, there's Ben. It wasn't Ben. It was my reflection in the store window. She thought it was Ben. There is a family resemblance, I know, in my family as there is in in your family. And how many of you look like one of your parents or a a grandparent? I I think Lynette looks like her great-grandma. I've seen pictures of her when she was younger, and, and you could see that almost like sisters. How many of you have your dad's mannerisms? How many of you say or have had someone say to you, you sound just like your mom? Does that ever happen? Lynette calls our granddaughter, Savannah, mini-me because she looks so much like Lynette when she was little. Lauren is four, and she has taken quite naturally to the piano and is starting to play songs. Lynette started to do that at four. And we can see ever-changing traits in our grandkids. Ava looks so much like Allison and yet smiles like Ben while Aaron is developing that analytical mind, just like his dad. And Maisie, well, she's just thinking cute, uh, with her mom and dad's big eyes. I I don't know. Am I sound like a a proud grandpa? I am. I I am. I I admit. And sometimes when relatives visit, I don't know if you have this in your family, you know, they say, boy, you know, he looks just like his grandpa. Or, Or, you know, 
He reminds me so much of, of your dad. But have you ever thought about us as Christians? What do people say about us? Do people say that we resemble our Heavenly Father? <laughs> do they say that we have His mannerisms and His way about us? H- have we ever really thought that that may be one of the finest compliments that we could ever get? Boy, you're so much like your dad. You're so much like your Heavenly Father. You know, I don't think I, I thought much about that until I was working on this passage. You know, as a Christian, I bear the name of my Heavenly Father. In bearing His name, I reflect and I resemble Him. In short, do other people see the family resemblance when they look at me? Do I look like Him? Now, I don't mean do I look like Jesus when he was here on earth, like a a first century (laughs) Jewish Israelite. I I mean something deeper. I mean something more meaningful than that. Do I, as verse 1 says, imitate God as a beloved child? Now, the word imitate literally means to mimic. And to mimic means to copy specific characteristics or traits. So imitating God means copying what he does and doing things like he would do and even saying things like he would say. And so when we had those bracelets, what would Jesus do? It's pretty accurate. Mimicking. Not only what would he do, but what would he say? And how would he go about doing it? Do I resemble my father in what I do? Now, I have to be honest with you. That absolutely blows me away, and it makes me a little nervous. (laughs) All at the same time. Do I reflect my heavenly father, and when others see me or hear me, do they see the family resemblance? Am I consciously and deliberately and intentionally and purposely and any other adverb I can think of keeping one eye on him and one eye on what I'm doing? Do I think of my heavenly father when I do or don't do something? Do I even consider what I say and how I say it reflects and sheds light on him and I either do it well or I do it poorly, or maybe a a, a mixture of both. You know, I think I thought for many years that it was all about me. It's all about me. God working in me, God working through me, and maybe using me by helping me so I could help others. And I, I don't think I really thought about how it reflected on him. Why? Because it was about me about what God was doing in me and through me. And I don't think I really ever thought of whether or not people were seeing the family resemblance. In the book of Daniel, the main character, Daniel, I think reflected his heavenly father. I I do. He was among the Jewish captives who were brought to Babylon from Jerusalem after Nebuchadnezzar had conquered the city. And he was quickly recognized for his intelligence and wisdom and his devotion to God while yet just a a younger teenager. And he was brought into Nebuchadnezzar's court and offered the finest of foods, but he refused to eat them so as not to defile himself. And so instead, he made a challenge that he and his friends eat only vegetables and water for 10 days instead of the wine and fatty, greasy, cholesterol-laden food of its captives. And then to look to see who looked better after 10 days. Well, guess who looked better? We now know why. (laughs) You know, it's kind of the feeling you get after you visit all your relatives during the Christmas season, you know, and eat all that tasty food that's not necessarily good for you, and you come back and step on the scale, and you go, how did I gain 12 pounds? Well, God blessed Daniel, and he was able to interpret the king's dreams, resulting in a huge promotion and prominence. And later when Babylon fell to the Persians, the Jews had new masters over them. And the king of Persia recognized Daniel's gift in this, and he found favor with the new king of Persia. 
And this caused jealousy with some of the insiders that the Persian king brought along with him. Who is this upstart, this, this Jew? And so they successfully plotted to have Daniel and his three friends thrown to the lion. And, and you know the story. And the story goes on to say that God miraculously saved them and his accusers and their families while they all became lion food. Now, I'm, I'm telling you all of this because of something that King Darius, a, a pagan king, said. He said in Daniel chapter 6, beginning verse 26, he said, I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed, and his dominion will be forever. He delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Now, I want you to notice King Darius' response. He didn't say that Daniel was courageous. He didn't say that Daniel was intelligent. He didn't say that he was accomplished or figured out how to escape from the jaws of the lions. But he said that Daniel's God had done it. Daniel's God. You see, Daniel reflected God. And when Darius, the king of the Persians, the most powerful man on earth, saw Daniel, he didn't just see Daniel, but Daniel's God. You see, because Daniel reflected his father in heaven. I want to be a modern-day Daniel. How about you? Do you want to be a modern-day Daniel or Daniel? Danielle, Danielle, Daniel, Dan, that's right, Danielle, thank you. But that means living in such a way that I reflect and increase my heavenly father's reputation in the world to people around me and that he's placed before me. And when I've done it well, when I've done it well, people who don't know God will look at my life and say, you know, George must have a great God. And God will look down from heaven and with a smile say, that's my boy. <laughs> That's my boy. And understanding that you are a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, it will change your life. Not just that it ought to change your life. That's true. But it means something more. Something, something more. To grasp that God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you and to trust in Jesus alone for your salvation. Now, that's a truth that can't help but change your life, redirect your focus, and give you enormous courage to serve God in Jesus' name. And why? And how can we do this? Or even imagine that it's possible? Because we are beloved children. Now, to be beloved is so much more than just loved. It's love plus. Beloved. It means dearly loved. It means cherished. It means treasured. It means adored. And because we are so very treasured, the Lord tells us in verse 2 to walk now and live in that love. How? Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. You see, when you know that you're greatly loved, that will change your life. Now, maybe there's some of you here this morning, that you don't feel greatly loved by God. You know what the Bible says. You've heard what others have say, but you have a hard time believing it for, for yourself. You may say, you know what? It may be true for others, but it's not true for me. Perhaps you feel forgotten. Perhaps you feel lonely. Perhaps you feel used and unappreciated. And we all know that it's not enough simply to say, I love you. Words, words mean little unless they are backed up with actions. And see, God knows this about us. And that's why he backed it up with solid proof. It says, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. God sacrificed his own son on our behalf. And Jesus' sacrifice was so pleasing to God that it says it was like a fragrant aroma. It was a fragrant aroma because Jesus voluntarily, 
laid down his life for us. His loving sacrifice so pleased the Father that the Bible says in 1 John 4 and 9, by this sacrifice, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that he, we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, Propitiation means that the debt caused by sin has been totally paid for. The debt was forever canceled, and we now, through Jesus, not only have right standing with God, but we've become beloved. Beloved children. Do you know that you're beloved? Do you know that? Not just here, but here. Know it deep inside where you are. Now, During this time of year, true and genuine Christians lament the cross, and and, and rightly so. It is terrible. It is a heinous form of execution. If we had been at Golgotha, we would have been repulsed by it. Crucifixion was a ghastly way to die. And the Romans intended to make it brutal and bloody. You see, they had mastered the art of cruel killing. And that day at Calvary, the smell of death was everywhere. But though its stench filled the noses of humanity, the cross smelled good to God. It was a fragrant aroma for him because he was well pleased by the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. And we know and can know and should know that we are greatly loved because God didn't just say it, but Jesus showed it. He showed it, and now, as a result, we could know it, that we are beloved of God because Jesus died a bloody death on our behalf. You see, this is who we are in the eyes of God. We are God's children, and we are greatly loved. And because we are greatly loved, we reflect who God is, and people see or should see the family resemblance. They should see the family resemblance, and that, in part, is why we do and don't do certain things. That's why we do and don't do certain things. Rather than a list of rules to appease God, we do it because we reflect our family. We reflect our Father, our Heavenly Father. Now, we don't all do it perfect, do we? We make mistakes. Now, I'd like to say that I'm so intrinsically good. I am so noble. I am so pure after becoming a child of God that I naturally do, that I naturally say, that I naturally act in ways that reflect my Heavenly Father. But if I were to say that to you, you'd be wondering who I was talking about. Certainly not George Calhoun, because you know me. So the Lord says that we need to put away the old us. He says, put it away. And put on the new us in Jesus Christ. And so he gives us a warning. He says, live as if we knew that others knew whose kid we were. Or put it another way, who's that kid's father anyway? Live as if people are asking, who is your dad? Verse 3 and 4. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Now, the underlying Greek word for immorality is the Greek word pornea. And it's not hard to see that we get the word pornography from it. It's a broad word. It really is. It covers all forms of sexual misconduct. One writer says it refers to all that that works against a lifelong union of a man and woman in marriage. Anything else? The word appears only in the New Testament because as the gospel spread across the Roman Empire, it confronted a culture that was thoroughly pagan and given over to every kind of sexual perversion. And I want you to think, aren't aren't you glad that 
evolution has uh, allowed humanity to advance to such a higher state of being that a society such as ours today no longer has to contend with any of that kind of behavior? Aren't you glad of that? Then in places like Corinth and Athens and and Rome, these ignorant, these less advanced societies suffer from such moral decay that they actually sunk so low that morality had become a matter of public indifference. Do what you want to do, when you want to do it, where you want to do it, with whomever you want to, and and don't do do it without shame. And this standard applied not only to the elites, but also to the common people. And the virus of uninhabited lust had affected every layer of society. The Ephesus, uh, the the temple of Diana in Ephesus had 10,000 temple prostitutes. And they combined idol worship with prostitution of men and women and children as a part of their Greek and Roman culture. And the early church encountered a world awash in, in Moral filth. And it was this very thing that the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 said that all believers everywhere, including in Ephesus, should not do. The term impurity refers to something filthy inside and out. It refers to pus around a wound or a decaying body. And that was the description. That was the description of ancient Greece and Rome. And I want to say that I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that the evolutionary process allowed our modern society to evolve beyond this base immorality and impurity. We don't face that today, do we? Yet it was into this world of moral decay that the gospel of Jesus Christ came with its liberating call to freedom from bondage, from forgiveness of sin, the importation of new life, and call to holiness, all in the shadow of the great intellectuals like Plato and Aristotle and Socrates. And to them, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 1 that the word of the cross was foolish to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, nonetheless, the gospel spread. The problems of the the culture tended to invade the church. And it's not surprising that when Christ wrote his seven letters to the church of Asia Minor, In Revelation 2 and 3, the most prevalent problems were false doctrines and immorality. Those were the two, false teaching and immorality. And are you glad that our evolutionary process of going from worse to better has allowed the church to evolve to such a higher order that we no longer deal today with false doctrine and immorality in the chambers of any church. (laughs) For those two things go hand in hand. First, we change what the Bible clearly says, and then we justify our behavior by making the Bible say what it doesn't say. I think a passionate pastor I once heard say, it's not just what you believe, it's also how you behave. Bad doctrine is, leads to bad living. And the reality is that if evolution were true, immorality and impurity would no longer exist because all it does is denigrate, debilitate, and cause a society and a culture to disintegrate. That's all it does. And the reality is that nothing has changed over the course of 2,000 years. And the reason I say that is because sin still hangs around And does what it has always done. Sin destroys. Sin kills. And when a culture no longer sees sin as sin, and evil looks less than evil, we have already progressed far down the path to self-destruction. Billy Graham has said that we now laugh at things that would have made us blush with embarrassment just a generation ago. What once was a red flag, we now ignore. We even laugh at And if someone dares to raise a voice of concern, he or she is called a legalist, they're called intolerant or bigot or a narrow-minded fundamentalist. But God's standards have not changed. We have and not for the better. 
And if we think we can follow the ways of the world and be unaffected by it, we are deceived. What we watch and what we read and what we listen to has an impact upon us. The people we hang around with, the jokes they tell, the way they talk, the way they act, for better or worse, it all has an impact on us. And if you run with the pigs, don't be surprised when you wake up covered with slop. Don't be surprised by it. God doesn't just tell us to stop doing things without telling us the consequences of it. Why? What is the reason? So he gives us the reason in verse 5. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. I'm going to let you go home and do some homework on what a covetous man and idolater are, but suffice it to say, if you are one, it's not a good thing. And if you continue to do it, the Bible says clearly, you forfeit your inheritance in the kingdom of God. Those are not my words. Those are the words of God. You see, in short, when you deliberately and intentionally snub your nose at God and say, hey, thank you for saving me, but I don't care how I live or how my actions reflect on you or the rest of the family of God, we've come really close, if not already, have crossed over to the dark side. And have we forfeited our inheritance into the kingdom of Christ? I guess the bottom line is this. If we're going to be a Christian, be one. (laughs) If we're going to be a Christian, not our form of Christianity... But what the Bible says is Christianity. You see, we have what we call a relative morality or a relative view. It's what I think about it. It doesn't matter what you think about it. It matters what God thinks about it. He's the one letting us in. (laughs) He's the one making the way. And it says the immoral and impure and the greedy and the covetous says it has no place. They have no place in the kingdom of God. Verse 6 says, let no one deceive you with empty words. In other words, don't let people, don't let preachers, don't let denominations tell you something is right when God says it's clearly wrong. Don't let them say that to you when it's clearly wrong. For because of these things, it says, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now, This is the sort of Bible verse that makes people very uncomfortable. makes me uncomfortable, and I have to preach it. You just have to listen. I have to hear myself. And they think that the Holy Spirit through Paul is being narrow-minded. He's being exclusionary. It's not politically correct to talk like this. And even some Christians squirm when they read a verse like this, and they say, how will we ever be able to reach the loss if we talk like this? People have to know we love them. (laughs) You know, that's a sentiment I think Paul would agree with. He reached more people than I think any of us will ever reach. There's nothing wrong with loving people. In fact, there is everything right, everything right about loving people. But the question is, do we love them? Do we really love them enough to tell them the truth, to be honest? That there is such a thing as the wrath of God. That there is a place called hell. And people will spend eternity there. People will. But do we love them enough to tell them how not to go there? Do we truly love them enough? Now I want you to notice something very significant. The Holy Spirit through Paul is not writing to the prostitutes in the temple not writing to the people in the streets. He's writing to the parishioners in the pew. That's who he's writing to. He's writing to us. His concern is for the believers in Jesus Christ, those who have been born again of the Spirit and are professing Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And if you read the book of Acts, you'll see that Paul never shied away from engaging people of the world. He crisscrossed the Roman Empire, sharing the good news, winning the loss, and establishing churches. And many of the Christians in Ephesus had come to Christ under Paul's preaching. 
And they had turned from idol worship. They had turned from gross morality, immorality to serve the living God. So don't make the mistake of thinking this passage is all about telling people how bad they are or what people who don't know the Lord should or shouldn't do. This letter is to believers, not to unbelievers. It's to the Ephesian believers. This letter is for us. But I do think he would say, you can't win the loss by adopting their sinful lifestyle. That's where our passage ends on a solemn note in verse 7. It says, therefore, do not be partners with them. In other words, don't share in the lifestyle of people who are going to hell. That's what it says. Don't be tricked into thinking that you can live like that. You can't. It's contrary to the gospel that saved you. The word for partners was used in the first century for intimate relationships that involved you in another person's way of life. Said another way, be friends with the lost, minister to the lost, but don't get caught up in their lostness. I think the message for all of us today is simple. If you're going to be a Christian and call yourself a Christian, then be a Christian. Reflect your father. Bring honor, honor to God's family. Why? Because the world around us is looking for truth. So let's live the truth. Let's live like it. And make a difference in this world. Let's pray. Father, this is a tough message. Lord, the conviction of your Holy Spirit weighs heavy on us. That's not just about me. It's not just about us. But we bring honor to our name. We bring honor to you. Or Lord, sadly, we bring dishonor to it. Father, help us to live in such a way that when others see us, they see the family resemblance. And that they can say with all honesty, you're so much like your dad. Lord, may we live that way. And we ask for your blessing and your help in doing it. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.